God, I hate these. If anyone knows a good pest control service, I'm all ears. Alright, let's pop this bad boy open and take stock of our assignments. Corn World, huh? These campaigns are a real cornundrum, that's for sure. I'm never going to be able to accumulate enough crystals at this rate. I apologize in advance for all the amazing jokes. What's this? Extra rules? It will be no small feat to shuck this husky assignment in a timely manner. What the? Allow me to set the stage for you. Control of the world has been split evenly between Valkia in the north and Scarbrand in the south, both agents of the Bloodguard, Corn. None of the lesser Corn-aligned factions were invited since minor factions tend to really shit the bed when it comes to interesting adversaries. For our part, the entire Empire and its closest affiliates remain independent and stand defiant against the blood-crazed hordes. The entirety of the Empire, including Sylvania and Lorelorn, are vassals of Reichland, as well as Corone and the Ice Court. You know I love central planning. Our goal is simple, control both of our enemies starting settlements without a single vassal being eliminated, including by confederation. This means I will have to spread the scarce resources of the capital province thin while defending the extensive borders of our domain and trying to fight towards the objectives. The campaign begins with France already deep into the First World War. The landscape is ravaged beyond recognition and uncountable corpses litter the countryside which is now nothing more than a single endless battlefield. King Louis declares the initiation of a campaign to restore Bretonia and immediately sets off to reclaim what he can, starting with Grung Zint. While Lewin is engaged in Reconquista, the Golden Order sets to work securing the mountains which form our southern borders. However, despite our allies' optimistic get-it-done mentality, not all is right in the Empire. Many threats persist within our borders which must be urgently dealt with before we can even dream of expanding outward. Hostile Wood Elves, Greenskins, Skaven, Beastmen, Norskins, and Vampire Counts are all seeking to corrode our nation from within. But chief of all threats is Festus, whose plagues and demons could fatally undermine our protection situation. While I have to entrust my vassals to handle the majority of these preliminary threats on their own, Hawkland stands virtually no chance against Festus and I must rush reinforcements to them if I want this campaign to last more than a few turns. Our main army, led by the Emperor Karl Franz, must remain dedicated to unifying the capital province however, and so we can only afford to send the military equivalent of a wet sock to augment our vassals' defenses. Meanwhile, Scarbrand works tirelessly to breach Gelt's steadfast fortification and it quickly becomes clear that we cannot hold out forever whilst our interior remains so thoroughly infested. Before we even begin to plan our conquest of the main objectives, we must consider the cleansing of the Empire our first priority. Festus works feverishly to infect the core of our lands with putrid pusses and villainous viruses from his corrupted fortress, the Brass Keep. His demonic forces harass and harangue Hawkland and Middenland and threaten to eliminate them altogether without immediate intervention. Unfortunately, the only troops we have time to recruit are a handful of archers and spearmen, forming a rather paltry brigade to reinforce Hawkland's garrison before it's too late. Even with our hastened efforts, we arrive to find the land marred with Nurgle's noxious and foul flora, with demons roaming the countryside freely. Just as our brigade sets up camp outside of Hawkland and begins preparing for the next move, Festus appears himself at the head of an odious horde and besieges Hawkland's final settlement. If we cannot win this battle, we will lose the entire campaign already. Badly outnumbered, we wait in the forest for our allies to arrive from the Hawkland garrison. They arrive just in the nick of time, and before we can emerge from our hidden positions, the demonic van Vanguard bursts into the wood. Fortunately, our Arch Lector has no issue dealing with the Manticore, and our spearmen heroically euthanize the Warhounds. All along the tree line, a tremendous battle erupts as Hawkland's militia surges onto the scene to halt the spreading of the Plaguelands. Although the demons inflict extraordinary losses on our coalition, we are able to defeat Festus himself, and in doing so, earn ourselves some more time as the fetid host returns to their hive to nurse their wounds. Seeing our bravery and skill in defending Hawkland, the entirety of the Empire is suddenly and conveniently much more supportive of our leadership. Oodles of trade agreement offers flow in from every non-demon still living, creating stronger diplomatic relations with our neighbors. 
While the few soldiers we could spare heroically maintain an imperial presence in the Plaguelands, Karl claims Helmgard, a fortress which defends a vital mountain pass directly into our capital region. The Grey Mountains form an extremely valuable natural barrier to our west and our south, through which there are only three passages, each defended by imposing fortresses. Having Helmgard in our control means that we can now send Franz to sort out Festus. Nursing his wounds deep in the underbelly of his festering fortress, Festus is dragged kicking and screaming out into the light, where he is forcibly disinfected by a hail of mortar fire and a general gunpowder goodness. We claim the fortress as our own from which to direct our defense of the north and leave the rest of the sanitization to our local allies. Having secured the Brass Keep, we enlist the help of Gotrek and Felix to help defend Kislev so that Franz can rush east to save Ostermark, which is also an imminent peril of annihilation. But first, we must attend to a growing threat in our mountainous borders. Although we are able to secure Fort Bergbrace, the last remaining mountain pass stronghold, demons yet reside deeper in the mountain ranges. We cannot leave all the work to our allies, and so an additional army must be trained and dispatched into the Southern Grey Mountains to assist in the purging of those demons. We learn a bitter lesson in the mountains when we meet the creatures living there in battle. Our standard fighting formations are shown to be no mask for the fury and frenzy of corn as the enthralled and snarling hordes wash over our lines and quickly overwhelm us. We conduct a panicked fighting retreat to a more defensible and irregular position from which we are able to just barely secure a costly victory. With the mountains slowly coming under our control, Franz and his army engage in a brutal battle alongside our allies and finally put Draka to rest back on the eastern front. Harl initiates the conflict by absolutely starching the Wood Elves' vanguard of heroes. Drykas Treemen tower over our human squadrons and effortlessly send Ostermark and Reichland warriors soaring into the air with their powerful swings. However, our heroes charge into the fray and stabilize the situation. Although Drykas warriors are protected by their thick bark, they can only sustain so many gunshots and inevitably succumb one by one until the day is ours. Coincidentally, both north and south of us, Kislev and Sylvania secure control of their territories, having overcome their own regional adversaries as well. Having brought an end to Draka and her cabal of malevolent branches, we take just a moment to rest, knowing that our empire is now internally stable. But the rest cannot last for more than a fleeting moment, knowing that the bloodthirsty hordes are ever at our doorstep. With this last opportunity to do so, we claim Gal Moraz from a quest battle, a powerful weapon which will greatly aid in our battles with chaos. Well, let's quickly recap. The Bretonian Reconquista is going disastrously. Thousands of dead warriors litter the corrupted landscape from Caron all the way to Carcassonne. Meanwhile, Kislev barely maintains its boreal borders under the pressure of Valkia's incursions. At least it is true that our internal affairs have improved now that all interlopers have been sent to the nether. With those domestic issues resolved, it's time to turn our attention outward and liberate some friends to help bear the brunt of Korn's wrath. First will be the High Elves of Ulthuan, whose efforts to liberate their own homeland will surely draw many of the enemy's resources away from us. Later will be the Dwarves, who will transform the Vaults into an impenetrable strongpoint from which the demonic momentum might be halted, and even reversed. Each of the southern provinces continue to take a thrashing and word begins to spread of a force of demons gathering south of Fort Sol, like starving socialists queuing up for their monthly bread rations. If the Empire is to weather the storm alone, it will surely crumple under its weight. If we are to persist, we must bring the High Elves back into the fold. It is not only the southern front that is facing pressure, however, and our own fortifications on the west endure attacks which we only survive because of the timely intervention of our ally, Marienburg. Although the demonic warriors are far better equipped, our soldiers bravely rush to their positions, but before they have time to assume the formation, the Feast of Reichland begins. Chaos Warhounds greedily pounce in and out of our formation for a light night snack, while our allies weave in and out of their reach. Chaos Furies descend on our crossbowmen's flanks like government employees botting someone else's money, as giants, chariots, and monsters of all kinds devour our front lines. The Chaos Spawn clearly never miss leg day as they fling our spearmen skyward. Marienburg desperately tries to hold our left flank, fighting back to back with Reichland as ogres and marauders swarm. With our allies fighting in a mob denser than a communist mass grave, our forces emerge victorious atop a mountain of mutilated bodies, just barely having overcome the enemy. The Golden Order continues to stave off attacks at Fort Sol, the third fortress controlling entry into our empire which they are currently administering for us. It is clear that our combined forces are terribly strained attempting to protect the outer borders, and so the urgency of liberating the High Elves is obvious. If only we had a central bank so that we could fund the war by inflating our currency. Human rights will damn us all, I tell you. 
Before we can reach Ulthuan, we must fight our way through Bretonia and set sail from the ruined city of Brian. We could try to sail from our capital, but that would potentially take longer and involve risking piracy from the demonic fortresses at Albion, which block our path to the Great Ocean. We stake our chances on Brian, and our forces charge through the mountain pass at Helmgard, hoping to surprise Valkia's occupation forces. Our army surges through Bretonia, tearing down every chaotic altar we can along the way, and there are many. The occupation forces are taken completely by surprise, and we reach our target before the enemy armies can react. After reaching the city of Brion, we repair whatever is necessary to get our forces onto ships and set sail directly for Ulthuan. By now, Valkia, whose forces dominate Ulthuan, is doubtlessly aware of our intentions. However, the element of surprise has already yes. paid off, as we will have arrived Let's long go. before her legions can fortify the coast. We land and seize control of Elisaeli, while Lewin assumes rulership of the lands we liberated on the way here. After a short period, we have freed a significant amount of the southeast of the continent, but the fun is over when Valkia and her forces arrive to restore the occupation. Tyrion and Altharion are both given control of their respective provinces, while we head north to defend our fledgling allies from Valkia's impending assault. Unfortunately, our armies are beleaguered and have had no time to rest since landing in Ulthuan, meaning that only scarce and injured squadrons remain to garrison the walls. The fresh cornate troops, who look like they've been injecting steroids into their butts and meth into their toes, are eyeing up our sensibly proportioned human soldiers like big greasy hamburgers. By utilizing the defensive towers and other improvised defensive installations, we are able to inflict a respectable amount of damage upon the enemy, and as we fall back to the inner defenses, all hope is not yet lost. But Valkia herself arrives and demonstrates a power not yet seen in the campaign, ripping through unit after unit of our warriors until our defenses finally collapse and our army is scattered to the wind. After our expeditionary force is diced into tiny little cubes, Torox appears and begins rampaging around Ulthuan, further worsening the situation for our High Elven allies. The Ulthuan campaign is already off to a rocky start, but for now, our attention is needed elsewhere. Valkia's lieutenant Baradon and his foul forces march from the frozen north to take Kislev and deliver a killing blow to our campaign, but we are miraculously able to rescue the garrison of Kislev even though our own army is annihilated in the process. Process. Having saved the ice court from utter destruction, we preserve our borders for yet another day. Just beyond the gates of Kislev, our forces take up a defensive formation and prepare for the enemy's charge. The demons waste no time in engaging us, bursting onto our infantry with a ruthless abandon. Our formations hold as long as they can, but our firepower is insufficient to send them back to hell, and soon our forces are in retreat, although by now only a handful are left alive anyway. Some of our forces race to the Kislev reinforcements, rallied by our general. Those who are cut off from our allies regroup on their own to resist the demons pursuing them and, surprisingly, slay the beasts which were on their trail, including the Chaos Giant. The Chaos Army was so weakened by its fight with us that the Kislev garrison are able to dispatch them handily, although our army will take a very long time to recover from these losses. While our attention is still set on the east, another army is sent to plug a hole in the World's Edge Mountains which the demons intend to use to pour directly into our heartlands. We seize Karak Ungor by sending a specialist team of pyrotechnicians and their guardians to clear out the chaotic citadel. They move through the streets, clearing out the demons with brutal efficiency, scorching them with rockets whenever they dare to show themselves. In securing Karak Ungor, we buy another day for ourselves, although this process involves sustaining several damaging counterattacks from the enemy in order to hold this new settlement. The enemy's exalted bloodthirster, Goral, leads the columns marching to retake Karak Ungor and is surprised to encounter Karl Franz himself, who readily defeats him in the skies above the battlefield as his forces are crushed below. Having drawn on the reserves of our vampiric vassals, we make use of powerful ghoulish monstrosities to hold the line steadfastly, even against their mighty chariots, while our artillery remains uninterrupted in its distribution of pain. Further attempts to take Karak Ungor are made, which illustrates how vital it was was that we had captured it when we did. Had we not, I can only imagine how fast our eastern vassals may have succumbed. Back in Ulthuan, Valkia returns, and without our expeditionary force to resist her, she attacks the shrine of Loek and brutalizes Eltharion, but is unable to completely destroy the settlement and must wait to regain her strength in the hinterlands. Unbeknownst to her, I had already redeployed an army to replace the one she had destroyed, and they kill her as she attempts to recover from her injuries at the shrine of Loek. It is clear that to regain control over the Ten Kingdoms, Valkia will need to return with greater strength and numbers. 
This buys us time and takes pressure off of the Empire long enough to turn our gaze south towards the Dwarves and Wood Elves. As we begin mustering additional forces at Altdorf with careful optimism and stark determination, our worst fears are realized. Garbrand bursts through Fort Sol with the rest of those unholy forces he had been amassing and devastates the countryside. Before we have time to react, Fyldorf is in ruins and the Golden Order is at risk of eradication. Three of our strongest armies are assembled at Altdorf and are designated the Southern Crusade, destined to one day storm the walls of desiccated Death Gorge and purge every ounce of chaos between there and Altdorf. After a tense river crossing east of Nuln, the Crusade engages with Scarbrand 3 to 1 and sends him back to oblivion on vacation. The mighty Southern Crusade is then able to destroy the demons infesting Fyldorf with facts and logic, fighting as an irrepressible three-army doomstack. Having handed back the lost provinces to the electors without having any of them being fully eliminated, they resupply at Fort Sol and prepare to face off with the hordes of demons still waiting to spill over the mountain passes. The Southern Crusade sallies out from Fort Sol and painstakingly banishes each of the demonic armies stationed throughout the highlands of the vaults. We liberate the dwarves of Clan Angrund, and then the Wood Elves of Athaloran shortly after. With the vault quickly developing into a major pain in the ass for the demons and the Wood Elves furiously redecorating Athaloran, the situation is beginning to look favorable. Deep in Ulthuan, the conflict rages like a socialist having to pay for something with their own money. With Valkyrie's legions swarming the High Elves from all sides, I can only think of how many fewer demons we have to contend with thanks to their valiant diversion. This is especially valuable in Kislev, where the borders are most frequently redrawn. Now that our allies have joined the fight, we turn our attention to an Empire Enclave in the far south, a perfect place from which to launch our attack on Death Gorge. Meanwhile, demons pouring in from the northeast and their Norskin underlings threaten to knock our offensives off balance. We leave our Elector Counts on their own to continue the war for the Border Princess, which quickly transforms into the infamous Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, a no-man's land of sprawling battlefields and ruined cities. While Scarbrand's forces are distracted attempting to police the lawless progressives gentrifying his neighborhood, the Southern Crusade will aim to capture Sartosa and plan our next steps from there. As our main army continues its march south, a retinue is left behind to finish liberating Athel Lauren. Making full use of the Vanguard deployment, our outriders blast unsuspecting legions of scurrying warhounds and equally startled marauders, giving us an early advantage. The enemy front line simply cannot catch a break as cannon fire and grenades tear through their armor with reckless devastation. After pulverizing the enemy with explosive and piercing ammunition, our cavalry charges through the shattered and scattered hornet husks, reaping their axes and shields in our bountiful harvest. Death Gorge is nestled into the highlands of the World's Edge Mountains near the Badlands, a place to which there's no easy route. If we attack from the north, we'll have to battle through countless legions and citadels, densely packed into unfriendly climates and wearying environments. Instead, we decide to liberate our allies, the Cult of Sigmar, by first taking Xandri and then marching straight south through the desert. By propping up an Imperial faction here, we will create a much more sustainable base of operations to begin our march to the first objective. Before we can depart for sandier shores, the vital port, Sartosa, must be ours to serve as our southern base of operations. The heroic Southern Crusade marches in their namesake direction to capture that key port, but are halted by a wall of demonic flesh and weapons eagerly awaiting them. Three fully stacked armies of demons charge headlong into the Southern Crusade as they arrive at Rip Rapha, resulting in a nearly cataclysmic battle which lasts for days as countless creatures and cavalry charge courageously into the fray. Although we eventually repel the initial waves, additional armies soon arrive and may fare much better against our wearying warriors, wiping out some of our most important units. Although the casualties piled at Rip Rapha are staggering, we remain the last ones standing. Carl himself arrives to put an end to the Tulane conquest and seizes first Argalus and then Sartosa by might of arms. With our Emperor now at the head of the Southern Crusade, we are ready. Our new allies, the Dwarves and Wood Elves, are rapidly making progress in their respective purposes. Even in Sylvania, the forces of our undead allies are gathering for renewed offensives. Not all is optimistic, however, as Valkia has been installing Norskin tribes as vassals of her own on the border with Kislev. And now those seeds have come to fruition, with Norskin raids raising settlements all along our northern border. The fire is truly under our butts now, and we must rush to make progress in Araby before the northern situation spins out of control. We land in Xandri with a massive fleet and demolish all resistance straight to Sudenberg. With Volkmar the Grim now governing the deserts, the situation is rapidly spiraling out of control for Scarbrand. Caught with his pants down, with many of his armies still skirmishing with Sylvania in the world's edge mountains and the border princes. 
Crossing the Badlands to reach Death Gorge is still arduous, with many demon armies hurling themselves at us in a frenzy, but by keeping our armies in the garrison stance and moving as a unit, we endure all assaults with ease. Once we reach Death Gorge, we surround it and immediately lay siege. One of the armies we've brought along this mighty Southern Crusade is more than half artillery, and lays a beating on the defenders more violent than the most peaceful Antifa activists. By the time Franz leads the Crusade into the Chaos Citadel, there is hardly anything left. The Southern Crusade has fulfilled its purpose, and we can check off the first objective from the list. Although the first major objective of the campaign has been secured, an apocalyptic development erupts the moment we plant our flags in the crenellations of Death Gorge. The Dwarven End Times begins with legions of the waddling beards pouring out from every cave and crevice, not unlike the Skaven they so despise, or bureaucrats. Our once allies, Clan Angron, join their cousins and betray us, threatening to undo all of our work. Before we can sail to Valkia's Citadel in the far northwest, we must first defeat these stout assailants who envelop us. Unfortunately for us, the Dwarven End Times is probably the absolute worst possible one we could have gotten. The Empire is absolutely surrounded by the little shits, and the 400 doomstacks they spawn threaten to instantly wipe out some of our vassals before we even have time to react. Sylvania and Ostermark are the most vulnerable without a doubt, and we have the majority of our forces in Death Gorge with no chance of making it back soon. Sylvania takes such rapid losses, in fact, they disappear faster than government employees hearing that there's actual work to get done. Our garrison in the area, the only one left in the entire empire due to our southern conquest, rushes to Tempelhof to try and stop the dwarves from knocking it over, and arrive just in time to participate in the ensuing battle. Just as our allies' caravan of odds and ends rattles onto the map, enemy forces come into view. Though we slightly outnumber them, they got flamethrowers and shit. Carl and crew dogfight the gyrocopters while dodging incessant artillery fire. The dwarves' axe infantry charge towards our allies, exposing themselves to heavy fire from our war wagons. Unfortunately, the dwarves' flame cannons are dealing serious damage to both our units and our allies. Realizing that politely shushing the artillery operators is our strongest bet, we send Carl to diplomatically disassemble the flame cannons while our heroes keep their bodyguards occupied. After the last of our allies are killed, we make use of our cavalry which up until now had been tucked away in the trees, and we set them upon the rowdy leprechauns in a furious surprise attack, and realign our chakras to repeat the process until two dwarven lords conveniently remember they had left the oven on at home. Several different factions of dwarves attempt to force their way through Fort Sol, sensing that our forces were already overextended and our Sylvanian defense must be consuming the last of our scarce resources. This is not the case, however, as we have thrown together a rapid reaction force and sent them to this vital southern passage. More than one wave of dwarves comes to knock us down a peg, and we steal ourselves for mutually assured slaughter. Our masochistic attackers readily endure much tower fire before blasting right through our walls, hobbling up the ladders and shimmying through the gaps with all the speed of stunted drunken gnomes. Our attempt to trample our guests is thwarted by their unbelievably girthy guns. Enemy gyrocopters annihilate our mortars while some pesky miners hijack our defensive towers. Luckily, the cavalry is able to stampede the outside forces, and we regain control of the walls, sending the invaders packing. Before we have a moment to recover, a second wave of hideous miscreants charges Fort Sol. Revisiting the previous strategy, we send the cavalry out immediately, sending minor confetti across the field. The dwarves waste no time in docking the walls, fleeing the hunting squadrons of horsemen. Luckily for us, this second assault lacks the range units that gave us so much grief last time, and the reinforcements consist of only a single lord who exhausts himself just reaching the fortress walls. In reserving our crossbowmen for a second attack and repeatedly spurring the dwarves away from our control points, our garrison is able to hold off the attackers, though not without paying heavily for the victory. Clearly missing the memo on what happened to their comrades, more dwarves swarm our hillsides, attempting to ambush France in the Sylvanian hinterlands. Our outriders burst from the trees, shooting and stomping angry Union men from all angles, while Carl administers a lesson in strike breaking to their artillery picket line. Iron Drakes test Franz's fire resistance, finding him surprisingly open-minded about being barbecued. Our pistoliers take a pounding from the hammer throwers and fire brigade. Although the flamethrowers cause the most significant damage, we are thankfully able to rid the enemy of their other ranged weapons, and spend the rest of the battle rounding up dwarves and assassinating them. 
Having survived each of the dwarves' attempts to excavate our family jewels, our southern crusade finally returns and shores up our stretched defenses. Counterattacks against the dwarves begin to take fruit, and although we lack the strength to completely eliminate them in the near future, we have restored a stable enough situation to begin planning to reach Valkia's pseudo-starting location in the Ironfoss Glacier. It will require a host of considerable size, but we receive reports that Grom Brindle, the White Dwarf, has inflicted a great wound upon Valkia's forces. This seems to be the case, since Ulthuan is finally nearing reunification, implying that the demonic occupation forces may have diminished. With the vault reclaimed alongside Ulthuan and Bretonia, it seems that we have overcome the Dwarven menace. Our Elector Counts continue campaigning successfully in the south, and although Norska remains a looming threat, our bastions on the northern shores present a more than formidable challenge to their ambitions. Before we can reach Valkia, we must set sail westward. We could hop from Bretonia to Ulthuan and then Nagarov, but to say that this would be inconvenient and prolonged would be a serious understatement. Meanwhile, we would have immediate threats remaining on our doorstep, jeopardizing the entire operation. Instead, we shall besiege Albion with the full might of our combined forces. Our vassals had attempted to seize control of the island many times throughout the campaign, but each time Valkia recovered it. Now we shall occupy it with such a force that no demonic host that has ever existed could hope to take it back. After Albion is seized by our vanguard, the rest of our armies arrive and assemble into a flotilla on the west coast. Across from us many miles away is Nagarond, once the proud capital of the Dark Elves, now a mere heap of rubble ascribed with chaos talismans and junk. Although the Sea of Chill is stormy and costs us many lives, there are simply too many of us and too much gunpowder for the defenses to repel. Now that we possess this vital gateway into the continent, we can resupply and recover our strength before venturing further inland. What we find in Negaroth is a land rife with conflict. The ancestral throng has armies, patrols, fortifications, and blockades scattered throughout the continent. Valkia's forces seem barely able to hold on to their possessions here, and it is clear that we are walking into a pre-existing conflict which is well underway. We fight our way across the tundra, and surprisingly, the final true opponent is Grom Brindle, whose forces are maintaining a barricade into the Iron Frost Glacier, presumably as part of a wider war effort against the demons. Our Northern Crusaders arrive in three armies and take formation atop a hill, central to the battleground. The dwarves are already badly wounded, signs that they had been combating Valkia for some time already. Despite their disadvantage, the obstinate dwarves insist that battle be joined, and we oblige them with rocket barrages, which force them from their positions into an even more disadvantageous charge. We had brought three units of Zotes with us, gifts from Athel Lorne, and these monstrous warriors single-handedly wipe out the entirety of Grom Brindle's army. It is a morbid spectacle for our forces, the bulk of which not needing to do so much as lift a finger during this battle, watching the end of the dwarves unfold just a hundred feet away. With Dagrak's end in our control, Cornworld comes to its rightful conclusion. Sure, there could be a wrap-up of total world domination, but with the situation developing as it is, our victory is as close to certain as it ever could be. Thus, another Warhammer world reaches the fulfillment of its purpose and is brought to a satisfying end. What? Phew, that was a lot of work and we still need a lot more crystals to keep those things outside from getting inside. I'm going to have to check on the barricades. I'm not sure how much longer they can hold out with all this increased activity happening lately. Hmm. Perhaps we could host some kind of grand tournament to discover champions to assist me with collecting the needed materials? Speaking of which, if you guys enjoy our content and want to get involved, consider joining our Discord server. There are going to be lots of exciting things happening there in the coming months, and hopefully you can even help in my quest. Until next time.